Are you looking for an Amazon Kindle Direct publishing alternative? Would you like to see something that's very similar in Kindle Unlimited by way of something called Kobo Plus? Well, you can now do that through a platform called Kobo Writing Life. And believe it or not, Kobo Plus is a little bit better than what you get with something like KDP Select, where it's an exclusive program. Kobo Plus allows you to be non-exclusive, meaning that you can reach all of their readers through a subscription-based service called Kobo Plus. And more recently, in April of 2023, Kobo Writing Life just announced that they're expanding their subscription-based service, Kobo Plus, to the United States and UK, and they have a ton of other regions. So I was super happy to sit down and speak with the director over at Kobo Writing Life, Tara Kremen. And without any further ado, let's jump right into this very insightful interview. It's still hot news right now. Kobo Plus just, it launched over into the US and UK. Formerly, it was just in Canada. This is super exciting news. Share with me, what does this expansion mean for Kobo Writing Life and the authors utilizing the platform? So what it means is that um, our Kobo Writing Life authors now get to put their books into the subscription market in the US and the UK. Um, so that's sort of rounding out our core English geos. So we've had the subscription model um, available in European geos. We launched in our home turf in Canada in 2020, expanded into Australia and New Zealand. And now finally, we're bringing it to the US and the UK again. So it sort of just rounds out that, that kind of market for authors that are sort of the main areas where you're going to be selling selling books in English language. So we were really stoked to be able to roll this out. With this super wide distribution, do you guys anticipate that you'll be reaching any other markets at all? Ah, maybe in the future. I mean, never say never, but right now we're focusing on these areas and sort of um, really developing this, because uh, they're areas that are familiar with Kobo. Um, they know our devices, they know our interface and our systems uh, and how everything works. And now we're just trying to entice that subscription reader to get into the Kobo um, uh, mindset. Let's take it a couple steps back because there's probably going to be some people that are listening in on this conversation and saying, okay, what exactly is Kobo Writing Life and what is Kobo Plus? So let's just back it up a little bit. What is Kobo Writing Life? Sure. So Kobo Writing Life is Kobo's self-publishing um, platform. So it allows authors and publishers to easily publish their books, and those can be available on Kobo.com and our partner sites. Um, so you can publish ebooks and audiobooks directly with us. So it's just an easy way of getting your books up into the Kobo system and, and getting in front of Kobo customers. And so Kobo Plus, um, in addition to this, is sort of a, it's like an all you can read, all you can listen model for the customer. Um, so they they can pay, um, depending on the geo, there's a monthly subscription and it's as much as they can read, as much as they can listen. Some of the plans are as much as they can read and listen. Um, and so what we're allowing um, Kobo Writing Life authors to do is to really easily get their books into this catalog um, and in front of this, this growing audience. Let's take a look at Kobo Plus for just a moment here. I did notice that there's three different models and entry points for readers to get into this. Um, explain those three separate models. And also, I think everybody's going to want to know how much does it cost for the readers and what do the authors get for the readers reading their books? So the costs really vary on the, the geo that you're in, um, but I think we're kind of primarily focusing on the, the US market here. So I'll sort of use, use that as my basis. So if you are a customer and you are a voracious reader and you just like reading the next book after the next book. Uh, so rather than buying um, each book individually, you'd have the option of paying, um, I think it's $7.99 for just uh, reading eBooks. And that allows you to sort of just any books that you would like to read that are available in the Kobo Plus catalog, um, you can pay that monthly subscription and read as many of these books as you would like. Um, if you'd prefer to just listen to audiobooks, you have that option as well. Or perhaps you want to bounce between both ebooks and audiobooks. Uh, so I do believe it's $9.99 in the US um, to have a monthly subscription where you can listen and read as many of the Kobo Plus books that you would like. Um, so then on the author side, which is sort of the the kind of uh, more important to your audience, I would say. Um, so uh, it works out on a revenue share model. So it's very similar to how a lot of the subscription models are working in the market. Um, so what we do is that we take all of the subscription revenue per month, and that is sort of one um, pool of money. And then what we do is divide that. Um, and the main difference about how we calculate the payment is that instead of page reads, we're actually using the, the minutes that a book has been read or listened to. 
Um, one of the reasons that we do this is that it allows us to treat these ebooks and audiobooks exactly the same. Um, so we're we're using minutes as our calculation. So we have your pool of subscriber revenue, uh, and we divide that by the total number of minutes that uh, uh, the books have been read in this geo in this month. And that gives us what's called um, the value per minute. Um, so this is very similar to um, sort of like a page read. It's the value that we're using each month. And this will ebb and flow as subscribers dip in and dip out and there's more books read or less books read. So then we're using this. Um, and for your book, we are um, using this value per minute. We're multiplying the amount of minutes that your book was read. And then the author's revenue is 60% of this then at the end. Um, so it sort of sounds complicated, but it, it isn't really. It's very similar to the other subscription models. Interesting. So if I've got like an epic length novel, I'm probably going to make it's safe to say I'm probably going to make a lot more with my epic length novel versus say my short kids book. Uh, yeah, the shorter um, books will just take a little bit longer to gain the traction. But yeah, it is sort of because it's based on the, the minutes, um, the longer the book, the more that you would get paid. Um, but it's sort of an interesting thing that we're noticing is that um, actually box sets are doing really, really well in this model. Um, so that's something where people can bundle a bunch of books together. Together. Um, so with Kobo, um, we actually don't have any higher price cap when you are making box sets. So if you are um, having a box set that can be multiple books together, if it's priced over $9.99, you're still earning 70% on those full priced sales. Um, so you can price it as, as high as you want within reason. Um, but what we're seeing, which is kind of interesting to me, is that... Um, you know, even with a subscription model, when you do have access to all the individual books, um, our customers sort of see it as a convenient way of getting a box set and just having all of the books in one place. So we're definitely noticing those um, kind of float to the top of our, our top read books is definitely um, something there. And, and because those are longer books as well. So you're getting paid for all of that. Um, you're also getting paid for any rereads that are happening. So that's something to note that people might not realize. Interesting. So someone can probably say, check out my book. They go through, they read the whole thing and say another couple months from now, they check it out again and I will still get credit again for something like that. I mean, I wouldn't want you to encourage an, uh, a customer to be... I mean, if they're a fan and want to read it a bunch of times, that's awesome. But you want to make sure that you're being very clear. This is this is a book that maybe you already own. <laughs> right, right. You're not wanting to manipulate the system. This is super fascinating. And one of the part I think, I don't know if you've addressed this already, is exclusivity versus non-exclusivity. And I think one of the unique parts is the fact that you guys don't require non-exclusive. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I should have definitely said that off of the top of the bat. Probably the biggest differentiator is that there is no exclusivity required. So um, our ethos in general is that um, we want you to get your books in front of as many readers, however they want to read them. Um, so we wouldn't want to tie you into just being in one storefront um, by participating in this. So we want you to be able to put your books into Kobo Plus and also publish wherever else that you want to publish. Um, so we even built out our Kobo Plus system to allow you to um, you can select the geos. So if you want to test out the US market, but you don't want to test out another place, you, you can do that. You can select exactly where you're going. You can also remove your books at any time. We don't have any time limit on them. Um, you know, I'd encourage you to leave your books in to try and gain traction, of course, uh, but we're not going to kind of penalize or restrict um, authors in any way. So we wanted to really build this out, giving as much control to authors as possible. So interesting. Having my book, let's say in Kobo Plus, Will it help me out, say, in building relevancy on the Kobo uh, platform, meaning that will my book be more discoverable by having this additional option? I do think it helps with your temperature on Kobo. Um, so that's what we kind of call your ranking. So um, it's not based solely on sales on the Kobo store. It, it is based on, you know, how much you're being browsed or looked at. Books that are similar to yours are being read. So it definitely will help um, with your temperature um, because you're going to be featured in different areas because we'll now have, you know, our different spotlights related to ebooks and stuff but there's also going to be this whole other area where we're, we're kind of like highlighting these books to the Kobo plus reader um so it definitely will help that um i know that our merchandising team are definitely going to appreciate books that are also included in Kobo plus just because it'll be helping us sort of um boost that and kind of just double down on on the the kind of attention that we're getting on that book for sure so cool now you're getting into like the nerdy land i love this so let's talk <laughs> a little bit more about temperature does temperature vary from one region 
region to the next. So will my temperature be different in the US, say, versus the UK? Yeah, it is. It is very tailored to each geo. So um, at Kobo, we like to take what we call a globally local view of book selling. Um, so we are a global company, books being sold all over the world. Um, but we do know that there are certain nuances between selling books, you know, even between the US and Canada, there are differences, but as, particularly in between like selling books in Europe or selling them in North America. Um, so in that sense, yes, your temperatures, it, it does vary because we are kind of um, trying to individualize the store fronts as best that we can to those specific markets. This is so cool. So I've got another question we can kind of build off on this one. Will it favor the author or will the temperature increase, if you will, if I have both the ebook and audiobook available on Kobo? I believe so. If they were both um, in Kobo Plus as well, um, I don't see why not. <laughs> um, but I definitely do think because we link them together on your product page. So if um, it's really important, this is now to get into really nerdy territory is where your metadata is just the most important thing here, because you want to be able to link your ebook and your audiobook. So you want to make sure that you have your ISBNs entered correctly, and you want to make sure that your series is entered correctly um, and then even to go another level um, you might notice when you're publishing with Kobo Writing Life that we do have an area for you to put your print ISBN in and while we don't sell print books on Kobo some of our partner stores do so what this does is actually allows our partner stores to link you know your print book your ebook and your audiobook all together so for instance in like ball.com in the Netherlands they'd be using this or, or any other partners that we have so in case you were ever wondering why we were asking for that even though we don't sell print. It's so we can link all of this together. And as you were saying in your question, sort of like help increase the temperature overall for these books. You've talked about metadata. I, I love this. So can we dive a little bit more into keywords? Because I know you guys allow for keywords in the back end. How does that affect temperature? And what is the best way for me to research keywords on the Kobo platform? We don't have a field per se where you can just sort of enter a bunch of keywords um, as you could in other platforms. Um, so what I would say is to be a bit more mindful with how you're using them. Um, you can certainly put them into your synopsis at the bottom if you want to do even within your book. Um, but the way that our, our uh, search sort of works is that it's going to filter through to like your title, your subtitle, and then through the rest of your metadata. Uh, so what I would really do is make sure that your um, synopsis is, um, I always say SEO optimized, even though the O is optimization, but that you're you're really curating your uh, synopsis to be as SEO friendly as possible and using those keywords in a way where it's not so obvious to the reader that, hey, this is a keyword, you know, you're um, instead of just saying jam packed thriller, you know, you could kind of entice it into sort of like this thriller is, I mean, something that is a bit more inventive than that. But I would say, um, you can tell I'm not a writer, right? Um, but I would say um, to include that subtly within your synopsis itself is probably the best way uh, to leverage that um, through our in our system. And we're always looking for ways to sort of add this stuff to the store. So you never know, there might be keywords in the future. What about reviews? How do reviews work? And also, if somebody checks out my book on Kobo Plus, are they able to leave a review for it? Yeah, so the reviews um, can be done on the Kobo.com store so they can they get a prompt I think if they're reading for free on um, the app so we have an app that's available on iOS and Android so they can leave reviews after the fact um, they can leave reviews through our Kobo e-reading devices as well and then through the store too so that's a great point you can definitely um, I would say as an author really encourage people to leave reviews on Kobo as they're reading your book and as they're checking out a Kobo plus because um, customers certainly use reviews to to help per um, their you know decide on their purchasing Okay, so will the reviews affect temperature at all? I don't think so. Other than, I don't think it goes into the temperature itself per se. Um, that is a good question though, but I don't believe so. See, I told you, I, I love talking about this type of stuff and I think it's super <laughs> fascinating, especially seeing, and I'm just gonna address the elephant in the room. I mean, you've got KDP over here that they have so many moving parts and such, and it seems like they dominate the field. And this is why I get so excited about Kobo Writing Life because you guys are a viable contender and you have so many of these tools in place. And so that's why it's like, oh man, I love chatting about this. What was What would be one thing about Kobo Writing Life that you like the most but the authors know the least about or don't recognize the most. I mean, I like everything about the platform that we work on. I think um, maybe, <laughs> right, right. Um, I think just something in general that I think is a real differentiator to Kobo and Kobo Writing Life is 
Um, the fact that we we do everything ourselves, it's like a small team and our main focus is really just on the digital reading experience. So um, when we're making the devices, they're sort of designed in-house, we're doing all of that ourselves and it's, it's always to make sure that um, we're kind of optimizing as best as possible, you know, and we often come to market first with new features and devices and things like that. Um, so we're not trying to get you into get a customer into the Kobo ecosystem to to sell them something else. It's, it, it really is about the reading experience. Um, and we definitely use that mindset when it comes to Kobo writing life as well. So we're definitely keeping the authors front and foremost when we're developing these features. So for instance, like with building out Kobo Plus in these new areas, like making sure that we included the option to to select the geos, deselect them, giving as much control as possible. Um, we spend the time listening to authors and engaging that feedback. So that's probably something that I like the most is that I get to work with a bunch of people that just love books and, and really want to make this experience the best that it can be. Um, and I guess maybe authors might not realize um, that that is really, it's it's our bread and butter. <laughs> is Speaking of readers, um, one of my favorite apps I have right now is Libby. You're probably familiar with Libby because uh, it's put out by Overdrive. So let's address libraries, getting distribution via Kobo Writing Life. Is that still available? And uh, how can authors uh, upload to something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Overdrive, they're a former sister company of ours, and we still work very closely with them. And we love libraries, you know, um, headquartered here in Toronto, we have one of the largest library systems in North America. So we're big fans. Um, all of our Kobo devices come with Overdrive integration. So it's super easy for a reader to be able to just enter their library number and, and you know, check out books through their devices. It's it's really awesome. Uh, so from an author perspective, um, it's so easy to distribute. All you need to do is just enter a library price and then it goes into uh, the Overdrive system. Um, and we even have kind of like promotions that are um, tailored around um, the libraries from time to time as well. Um, but we definitely hear about um, just an increasing, especially um, just digital library lending is, is definitely on the rise um, and not slowing down, it seems. So I definitely would encourage people, if you're wide, I don't see why you wouldn't make your books available to to the libraries because it's a great system to support. And I know authors sometimes get questions from from readers being, you know, I, I can't afford your books, unfortunately. And and it can be something where you can always be like, yeah, you, well, you can go to the library and you can ask for them and get them there. And then that way that you're still making, um, you're still earning from, from your, your content there as well. Uh, what does the royalties work out with Overdrive? Uh, and does Kobo Writing Life take a percentage of those earnings? The authors earn 50% um, of any library sale that goes through. Um, so I think it is basically the highest rate that is out there for library distribution. I believe it's the same as if you were going direct with Overdrive. Um, so it's a pretty good deal if you're coming to um, Kobo Writing Life that you earn 50% on each um, sale. See, look, I, I just I know I'm asking all these softball questions because I know some <laughs> of these things and I think it's super exciting. I did not know, though, that Overdrive was directly integrated with the Kobo app. Am, am I right in saying that? Not the app, the e-readers. Yes, like the one you sent to me. <laughs> <laughs> Dale, are you, not, are you not reading on the Kobo? Is that what you're doing? You're not reading on it? <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. Like like I said, it, it's I usually get on my iPhone here. As we start to wrap up today's podcast interview, uh, I always ask every guest this, and I want to ask you this one as well, especially since you've spoken with so many authors over the years. What would be some advice that you would give to any aspiring author or self-publisher out there? I would say, I mean, I think first and foremost to keep writing and don't be kind of dismayed by... Uh, I think it can be wonderful to be independently published. There's so much information out there, um, but it can be a little bit overwhelming um, between not knowing where to begin or feeling like perhaps you've missed the window on something. Um, I just don't think that's the case. So I would say really focus on the writing um, because the more books that you have, the easier it is to market, the easier it is to sort of to build your audience there. And once you have a sort of good collection of books to be writing, then you can focus on the rest of it. And don't be afraid to reach out to us. That's We're here to help you succeed. So I would definitely say focus on your writing at the beginning. Um, and then when you're ready, come and talk to us and then we will help you, um, especially if you're publishing widely. And hey, while I've got your attention over here right now, make sure that you go over and check out this very next video where Kobo Writing Life is going to be answering all of your questions. I'll see you on over there.